The Ethics of Earning a Living by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali from the Revival of Religious Sciences. Introduction. We praise God with the praise of one who nullifies in his oneness all but the one true God and who vanishes away. And we glorify him with the glorification of one who states openly that everything other than God is false and does not shy away and that all those in the heavens and the earth cannot even create a fly, even if they combine their efforts, nor a moat. And we thank him for raising the sky as a built ceiling for his servants, and for laying the earth as a carpet and bed for them, and for wrapping the night over the day, making the night a garment and the day a means of livelihood, so that they may spread in seeking his bounty and rejuvenate with it from the desperation of needs. And we pray upon his messenger, from whose pool the believers will depart quenched after approaching it thirsty, and upon his family and companions, who did not spare effort in supporting his religion, neither slackening nor shrinking. And peace be upon him abundantly. As for what follows, the Lord of lords and the cause of causes has made the hereafter the abode of reward and punishment, and the worldly life the abode of bearing and turmoil and of striving and earning. And striving in the worldly life is not confined to the hereafter alone. Rather, livelihood is a means to the hereafter and an aid to it. For the worldly life is the farm of the hereafter and its approach. People are of three kinds. A person whose livelihood distracts him from his hereafter. He is among the worldly winners. The closest to moderation is the third whose livelihood is for his hereafter. He is among the moderate. One will not achieve the rank of moderation unless he adheres to the path of correctness in seeking livelihood, and one will not rise in using the world as a means to the hereafter and a method, unless he observes the manners of the sharia in his pursuit. And here we are presenting the manners of trades and crafts, types of earnings and their practices, and we explain them in five chapters. The first chapter on the virtue of earning and encouragement towards it. The second chapter on the correct knowledge of buying, selling, and transactions. The third chapter in explaining justice in transactions. The fourth chapter in explaining benevolence in them. The fifth chapter in the trader's compassion for himself and his religion. Chapter 1. On the merit of earning and encouragement towards it. From the Quran, God Almighty says, And we have made the day, a time, for livelihood, Quran. Mentioning this in the context of His grace, He also says, And we have made for you there in means of living. Little do you give thanks, Quran, thus presenting it as a blessing from your Lord and seeking gratitude for it. And He says, Then disperse through the land and seek from the bounty of Allah, Quran. Regarding the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, Among sins are those which are only expiated by the concern in seeking livelihood. He also said, The honest trader will be resurrected on the day of judgment with the truthful and the martyrs. And he said, Whoever seeks the worldly life lawfully, abstaining from begging, striving for his family, and being compassionate towards his neighbor, will meet Allah with a face as bright as the full moon. One day, while sitting with his companions, they observed a young man of strength and vigor diligently working. They remarked, What a pity that his youth and vigor are not in the cause of Allah. To which the Prophet, peace be upon him, replied, Do not say that. If he is working to support himself and avoid begging, or to enrich others, he is in the cause of Allah. But if his work is for boasting or competing in worldly gains, then he is in the cause of Satan. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also said, Indeed, Allah loves a servant who takes up a profession to become independent of others, and dislikes one who learns knowledge only to make a living from it. And in another narration, truly, Allah loves the professional believer. He said, the most lawful thing a man can consume is from his earnings, and every honest transaction is blessed. In another narration, the most lawful food a servant can eat is from his own handiwork, 
provided he is honest. He also said, Engage in trade, as it contains nine tenths of the provision. It is narrated that Jesus, peace be upon him, saw a man and asked him what he did. The man replied, I devote myself to worship. Jesus asked, Who sustains you? The man said, My brother. Jesus responded, Your brother is more devout than you. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, I do not know anything that brings you closer to paradise and further from hellfire except that I have commanded you to do it. And nothing that brings you closer to hellfire and further from paradise except that I have forbidden you from it. The trust word the Spirit has inspired in me that no soul will die until it has received its full provision, even if it is delayed. So fear our Lord and be graceful in the pursuit. He commanded to be graceful in pursuit and not to abandon it. He then said, Do not let the delay in provision drive you to seek it through sinning against Allah. For what is with Allah cannot be obtained through sin. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also said, The markets are dining tables of Allah, so whoever goes to them will gain from them. And he said, It is better for one of you to take his rope and gather wood on his back than to ask someone whether he gives or refuses. And, whoever opens a door to begging, Allah will open seven D doors of poverty to him. Regarding wise sayings, Luqman the wise said to his son, My son, be self-sufficient through lawful earning to avoid poverty. For no one becomes poor except that they are afflicted by three qualities, weakness in their faith, deficiency in their intellect, and loss of their honor. And greater than these three is people's contempt for them. You ma, may God be pleased with them, said, Do not sit back from seeking provision, saying, O oh Allah, provide for me, as you know that the sky does not rain gold and silver. Day bin Musalama was planting in his land, and Umar said to him, You have done well. Be independent of people. It is more protective for your religion and more honorable for you among them. Ibn Masid, may God be pleased with him, said, I dislike seeing a man idle, not engaged in the affairs of his worldly life or his hereafter. When asked about the honest trader, Ibrahim said, He is dearer to me, for he is in a struggle. Satan comes to him in matters of measurement, weight, and giving and taking, and he struggles against it. You ma, may Allah be pleased with him, said, there is no place where I would rather be when death comes to me than in a market, trading for my family. Al-Haytham said, Sometimes I hear of a man falling into misfortune, but I remember my self-sufficiency and it becomes easier for me. A upset, earning, even if small, is dearer to me than asking people. During a storm at sea, the passengers said to Ibrahim bin Adham, Do you not see this hardship? He replied, this is not hardship. The real hardship is needing people. A upset Abu Chilaba told them, stick to the market. For richness is part of well-being, meaning independence from people. Amai was asked about someone who sits in his house or mosque saying, I will not work until my provision comes to me. He replied, this man does not understand knowledge. Has he not heard the prophets, peace be upon him, saying, Allah has placed my provision under the shadow of my spear, and is saying about the birds, they leave their nests hungry and return full. The companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, engaged in trade by land and sea and worked in their palm groves, setting an example. Abu Chilaba said to a man, I prefer to see you seeking your livelihood than sitting in a corner of the mosque. It is narrated that Allah's eye met Ibrahim bin Adham who was carrying a bundle of firewood. Al-Azai said, O oh Abu Ashaq, until when will you do this? Your brothers can take care of you. Ibrahim replied, Leave me to this, for I have heard that one who stands in a humble position seeking lawful earnings is guaranteed paradise. Abu Sulaiman al-Darani said, Is worship only standing on your feet while others provide for you? Start with your bread. Secure it then worship. Mu'ab bin Jabal, may God be pleased with them, said, a caller will announce on the day of judgment.
Where are those who are disliked by Allah on his earth? The beggars of the mosques will stand up. This is the Sharia's disapproval of begging and relying on the sufficiency of others. And for those without inherited wealth, nothing can save them from this except earning and trade. If you say, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it was not revealed to me to gather wealth and be among the traders, but it was revealed to me to glorify the praise of your Lord and be among those who prostrate and worship your Lord until certainty, death, comes to you. And it was said to Salmon the Persian, Advise us. He said, Whoever among you can nigh while on pilgrimage or as a warrior or as one who builds his Lord's mosque should do so, and let no one die as a wage earner or a traitor. The answer is, the way to reconcile these reports is by distinguishing the situations. We do not say that trade is absolutely better than everything else, but that trade is either sought for sufficiency, wealth, or more than sufficiency. Seeking it for excessive wealth and hoarding without spending on good deeds and charity is blameworthy, because it is an indulgence in the worldly life, the love of which is the root of all sin. If it also involves oppression or treachery, it is injustice and sin. And this is what Salmon meant by saying, Do not die a traitor or a traitor, meaning a seeker of excess. However, if trade is sought for sufficiency for oneself and one's family, and one could suffice them by begging, then trade to avoid begging is better. And if one does not need to beg and is given without asking, then earning is better, as he is given because he is silently begging and declaring his poverty among people. Therefore, modesty and concealment are more complete than idleness, and even better than engaging in bodily worship and neglecting earning. For four groups, a worshiper engaged in bodily worship, a person on a spiritual journey and hard work in the sciences of states and unveilings, a scholar busy raising knowledge of the outward sciences that benefit people in their religion, like a jurist, exegete, hadith scholar, and their likes, or a person busy with the interests of Muslims and responsible for their affairs, like a ruler, judge, or witness. If these are sufficed by designated funds for public interests or endowments for the poor or scholars, then their focus on their work is better than engaging in earning. This is why it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to glorify the praise of your Lord and be among those who prostrate, and not to be among the traitors, because he embodied these four meanings with additional qualities beyond description. This is why the companions advise Abu Bakr, may God be pleased with them, to leave trade when he died. He bequeathed his wealth to the public treasury, as he cite initially more appropriate. And for these four groups, there are two other situations. One is that their sufficiency comes from the hands of people and what is given to them in charity or alms without needing to ask. So leaving earning and engaging in their work is preferable as it helps people in good deeds and accepting from them what is rightfully theirs and better for them. The second situation, the need to ask, and this is a matter of consideration, and the emphases we narrated in questioning and its condemnation indicate that modesty in asking is preferable, and to generalize the statement without considering the situations and people is difficult, but it is left to the discretion of the servant and his view of himself to compare what he faces in asking in terms of humiliation and violation of honor and the need to burden and persist with what he gains from engaging in knowledge and work in terms of benefit for him and others. Sometimes a person's benefit to creation and his benefit in engaging in knowledge and caution are many, so he should consult his heart even if the legal scholars give him a fat walk. For the fatwas do not encompass the details of the situations and the nuances of the states. Indeed, among the predecessors were those who had 360 friends, each of whom they would visit every night, and those who had 30. And they were engaged in worship because they knew that those who took care of them took on a favor by accepting their charity. So their acceptance of their charity was an added good deed to their worship. Therefore, 
one should carefully consider these matters. For the reward of the receiver is like the reward of the giver. As long as the receiver uses it to aid the religion and the giver gives it with a willing heart. And whoever understands these meanings can recognize the state of himself and discern from his heart what is best for him in relation to his situation and time. So, this is the virtue of earning, and let the contract by which earning is made encompass four matters, health, justice, benevolence, and compassion for the religion. And we will start with mentioning the causes of health in the second chapter. Chapter 2 on the knowledge of earning through sale, usury, salam, advance payment, leasing, mudaraba, profit sharing, partnership, and explaining the sharia conditions for the validity of these transactions, which are the pivot of earnings in sharia. Know that acquiring knowledge in this chapter is obligatory for every Muslim who earns, because seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim and it specifically refers to the knowledge one needs. The earner must understand this chapter to be aware of the corrupt practices in transactions and avoid them, and to recognize the complex issues that may arise and seek clarification when needed, without a basic understanding of the causes of invalid transactions. One wouldn't know when to stop and ask for guidance. If someone says, I will not seek knowledge, but will wait until a situation arises and then learn and seek a fatwa, it can be said to them. How will you recognize the occurrence of a situation if you don't know the general corruptors of contracts? Without this knowledge, one might continue in transactions, thinking they are valid and permissible. So it is essential to have at least this level of knowledge in commerce to distinguish between what is permissible and what is forbidden, and what is clear from what is doubtful. This is why it was narrated about Umar. May God be pleased with him, that he used to patrol the market, hitting some traders with a stick, saying, No one should sell in our market unless they understand the law, otherwise they will inadvertently deal in usury, whether they like it or not. Although contracts are many, these six are inseparable from earnings, sale, usury, salam, leasing, partnership, and mudaraba. Let's explain their conditions. The first contract, sale. God Almighty has permitted it, and it has three pillars, the contracting parties, the subject matter, and the wording. The first pillar, the contracting parties. A trader should not deal in sales with four types of people. A minor, a mentally incapacitated person, a blind person, and a slave. The sale by a minor or a mentally incapacitated person is invalid as they are not legally responsible, and their sale, even if authorized by a guardian according to Shafi'i, is not valid. Anything taken from them is guaranteed by the trader to them. As for the blind person, since he cannot see what he buys or sells, this is not valid. He should be advised to appoint a sighted agent to buy or sell on his behalf. The transaction of the agent is valid. But if the trader deals directly with the blind person, the transaction is invalid, and whatever taken from him is guaranteed by the trader at its value. As for the non-Muslim, it is permissible to transact with them, but it is not permissible to sell them a copy of the Quran, a Muslim slave or weapons if they are from the people of war. If don't, such transactions are rejected, and the trader disobeys his lord. As for soldiers from Turks, Turkmen, the West, Kurds, the markets, traders, usurers, oppressors, and anyone whose wealth is mostly unlawful, it is not appropriate to own anything from them because it is unlawful, except if one knows for sure that something is lawful. The details of this will be explained in the book on Halal and Haram. The second pillar, concerning the subject matter of the contract. This refers to the property intended to be transferred from one contracting party to the other, whether it be the price or the priced item. Six conditions must be considered for it. First, the item must not be intrinsically impure. Therefore, it is not valid to sell a dog or a pig nor to sell feces or excrement, 
nor is it valid to sell ivory and items made from it. As bone becomes impure through death and cannot be purifying through ritual slaughter, it is also not permissible to sell wine or impure substances extracted from animals that are not eaten, even if they could be used for lighting or coating ships. However, selling oil that became impure due to the fall of impurities or a dead mouse in it is permissible, as it can be used for purposes other than eating and is not intrinsically impure. Similarly, I see no issue with selling silkworm eggs, as they are the origin of a living creature that can be beneficial, and comparing them to eggs, which are also the origin of a living creature, is like comparing manure. It is permissible to sell muskrats, and they are considered pure if separated from the deer while alive. Second, the item must be beneficial. Therefore, it is not permissible to sell insects, mice, or snakes. No consideration is given to the use of a snake by a magician, nor to the use of it by performers to show it to people. It is permissible to sell cats, bees, leopards, lions, and other animals that are useful for hunting or whose skin is beneficial. Selling elephants for carrying loads is permissible, as is selling parrots, peacocks, and other beautiful birds, even if they are not edible as enjoying their sounds and appearance is a permissible purpose. However, owning a dog for its appearance is not permissible as prohibited by the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. It is not permissible to sell musical instruments such as outs, cymbals, flutes, and other amusement devices as they have no permissible use. Similarly, selling figures made of clay, like animal figures sold for children's play during festivals is not permissible as breaking them is a religious obligation. The depiction of trees is more tolerated. Selling clothes, dishes, and cartons with animal images is permissible. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told Aisha, may God be pleased with her, to make cushions from them. It is not permissible to use them when erected, but permissible when laid down. If a beneficial use is permissible, then the sale is valid for that purpose. Third, the item being transacted must be owned by the contracting party or authorized by the owner. It is not permissible to buy from someone other than the owner, waiting for the owner's permission. Even if the owner later agrees, the contract must be renewed. It is also inappropriate to buy the husband's property from the wife, or the wife's property from the husband, or the parent's property from the child or the child's property from the parent, based on the assumption that if the owner knew, they would agree. If consent is not prior, the sale is not valid. These are common practices in markets that a religious person must be cautious about. Fourth, the subject matter of the contract must be legally and physically possible to deliver. It is not valid to sell something that cannot be physically delivered, such as a runaway slave, fish in water, a fetus in the womb, or the semen of a stallion. Similarly, selling wool on an animal's back or milk in the udder is not permissible due to the difficulty of separating the soul part from the unsold part. Items that are legally impossible to deliver, such as pawned items, endowments, or those born in captivity, are also not valid for sale. Also, selling a mother without her young child or the child without the mother is not valid if the child is young, as delivering them separately is forbidden. Fifth, the sold item must be known in terms of its identity, quantity, and description. For identity, it must be specifically indicated. If someone says, I sell you a sheep from this flock, or a cloth from these clothes, or a yard from this fabric, take it from any side, or ten yards from this land, Take it from any side you wish, the sale is invalid. These are practices of those who are lax in their religion. However, selling a sheared interest, like half or a tenth of something, is permissible. For quantity, it is determined by measurement, weight, or visual inspection. If someone says, I sell you this cloth for the same price someone else sold it for, and both parties are unaware of that price, the sale is invalid. But if someone says, I sell you this bag of coins or this piece of gold, and they see it, 
the sale is valid, and estimating by sight is sufficient to determine the amount. For description, it is determined by seeing the item. Selling something unseen is not valid unless it was seen previously and is not likely to have changed significantly. Description cannot replace the actual item. This is one of the two opinions. It is also not permissible to sell cloth on the loom based on patterns, nor to sell wheat on the stock. Selling rice in its husk used for storage is permissible, as is selling walnuts and almonds in their inner shell, but not in both shells. Selling fresh teas in their pods due to necessity is tolerated, as is selling truffles due to the practice of earlier generations, but this is considered permissible for a price. If it is bought for resale, the analogy suggests its invalidity as it is not naturally covered, but some tolerance may be allowed, as removing it causes spoilage, like manna. 6. The sold item must be in the buyer's possession if its ownership was gained through a transaction. This is a specific condition. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prohibited selling something before taking possession of it. This applies to both real estate and movable property. Any sale or purchase before taking possession is invalid. Possession of movable property is through transfer and real estate through vacating. Possession of something bought with the condition of measurement is not complete until it is measured. As for selling inheritance, bequests, deposits, or anything not acquired through a transaction, it is permissible before taking possession. The third pillar, the wording of the contract. The contract must include an offer and an acceptance related to it, expressed in words that indicate the intended purpose, whether explicitly or implicitly. For instance, if one says, I give you this for that, instead of saying I sell you, and the other person accepts, it is valid as long as the intention is to sell because it could also imply a loan if it involves two garments or two animals. But the intention removes ambiguity. Explicit wording is more decisive in preventing disputes, but implication can also convey ownership and choice. However, one should not establish a condition in the sale that contradicts the nature of the contract. For example, stipulating an additional item to be included or that the sold item be delivered to the buyer's house, or buying firewood with the condition of being transported to the buyer's house. All these are invalid unless the transportation is separately contracted with a known fee independent of the purchase of the movable item. According to Shafi'i, a contract is not established solely by actions without verbal expression, but it is established in minor matters according to Abu Hanifa. Defining minor matters is difficult. If referred to customs, people have exceeded minor matters in transactions. For example, a broker takes a valuable garment from a seller and delivers it to a buyer, who accepts it and pays without any verbal expression of offer and acceptance. Similarly, in auctions, bids are placed without explicit offer and acceptance. These are complicated issues that do not accept easy solutions. The possibilities are three, either to allow transactions by mere action in both minor and significant matters, which is impossible as it involves transferring ownership without words indicating it. To completely prohibit such contracts, as Shafi'i suggested, which is problematic for two reasons, or to distinguish between minor and significant matters, as suggested by Abu Anifa, which complicates defining minor matters. If you ask how to act in situations where you are a guest or at a table, and you know the host rely on implied agreements in buying and selling, should you abstain from eating? I say, one should abstain from buying if the item bought is significant and not among the minor matters. As for eating, it is not obligatory to abstain as the action can be seen as implying permission. The matter of permission is broader, and transferring ownership is narrower. Every food item involved in an implied sale, the seller's delivery implies permission to eat. Known from the context, like the permission to enter a bathhouse, the permission for food can be seen as if the seller said, 
I permit you to eat this food or to feed it to whoever you wish. This is my understanding of the legal analogy. However, after consuming the food, the buyer is responsible for compensating the seller. This covers the complexities of implied transactions. Ultimately, knowledge belongs to God, and these are assumptions and opinions we have presented. The fatwa can only be based on these assumptions, and as for piety, one should consult their heart and avoid doubtful situations. The second contract, the contract of usury, reba. God Almighty has forbidden usury and severely warned against it. Money changers who deal with currencies and those who trade in foodstuffs must be particularly cautious, as usury only occurs with currency or food. Money changers must avoid two things, delay and excess. As for delay, they must not exchange one of the currencies for another except hand to hand, meaning the exchange should occur in the same sitting. Avoiding delayed transactions. Exchanging gold for minted dinars is prohibited due to delay and typically involves excess, as the minted currency is not usually returned equal in weight. Regarding excess, they must be cautious in three aspects. Trading broken for intact currency, where transactions must be equal. Trading high quality for low quality currency, where one should not buy lower quality with higher quality unless the weight is lesser, or sell lower quality for higher quality with higher weight, especially when trading gold for gold or silver for silver. If the types differ, there's no harm in excess. Thirdly, in composite items of gold and silver, like dinars mixed with gold and silver, if the gold amount is unknown, the transaction is invalid unless it's a common currency in the country. Similarly, dirhams adulterated with copper are invalid unless commonly used. If it's standard currency, transactions are permitted due to necessity. The third contract, Salam, advance payment. Traders must observe 10 conditions in Salam contracts. The capital must be known in kind so that if delivery of the sold item is delayed, one can return to the value of the capital. Selling a specified amount of dirhams in wheat, for example, is invalid. The capital must be delivered in the contract session before parting. If they part before receiving it, the Salam contract is nullified. The item sold must be definable like grains, animals, minerals, cotton, wool, silk, milk, meat, perfumeries, etc. It is not permissible for mixed or composite items, varying parts like different arrows or shoes or animal skins. Salam and bread is permissible, overlooking minor differences due to cooking. The description of these definable items must be detailed to avoid value variation. If deferred, the term must be known, not set to harvest or fruit ripening, but to months or days. The item must be deliverable at the term and generally available. Avoid salam and fruits or other items not typically available at the term. The delivery place must be specified in items where location affects value. Avoid specifying a particular item, like wheat from a specific field or fruit from a specific garden as this nullifies the debt nature. However, specifying the produce of a large town or village is acceptable. Avoid salam and rare, precious items like a specific pearl or beautiful slave girl with her child, or other items generally unattainable. Avoid salam and food if the capital is food, regardless of type, and avoid salam and currency if the capital is currency. This was mentioned under usury. The fourth contract, leasing. Leasing has two main components, the lease payment and the benefit. As for the contracting parties and the wording, what we mention in the sale applies. The lease payment, like the price, must be known and described in detail. If the payment is a debt, its characteristics and amount must be known. Caution must be exercised in situations commonly encountered such as leasing a building for its renovation, which is invalid since the cost of renovation is unknown. If the tenant is required to spend a certain amount on renovations, it is not permissible, as the effort in renovation is unknown. 
Leasing a miller with payment in brain or some of the flour is invalid, as is any arrangement where the outcome depends on the worker's effort. Also, specifying the lease amount for houses and shops without determining the lease term renders the duration unknown and the lease contract invalid. The second component, the intended benefit of the lease, which is the work itself if it is a known, lawful activity involving effort and is typically delegated. Leasing is permissible in such cases. However, to avoid prolixity, we will not delve into the details here, as they are extensively discussed in jurisprudence texts. We will only touch upon commonly encountered issues in leasing, which should consider five factors. The activity should involve effort and labor. Leasing for displaying food in a store or for drying clothes on trees or leasing money to decorate a shop is not permissible. These benefits are like minor things, such as looking in someone else's mirror or drinking from their well, which cannot be sold. Thus, hiring a salesperson to say a word to promote merchandise is not permissible. What salespeople take for their influence and reputation in promoting goods is unlawful, as it involves no effort or value. The lease should not aim to acquire a specific item, like leasing a vineyard for its grapes or livestock for its milk. However, hiring a wet nurse is permissible as her milk is secondary and indivisible. Similarly, Minor materials like ink or thread in writing or sewing are tolerable. The work should be on behalf of the lessee. It's not permissible to take payment for jihad or other non-delegable acts of worship. However, it is permissible for hajj, washing the deceased, digging graves, and carrying funerals. There's disagreement on taking payment for leading tarawih prayers, calling to prayer, teaching, or reciting the Quran. The work and benefit must be known. A tailor's work is known by the garment, a tutor's by the specified sora, and a carrier's by the load and distance. Any commonly disputed matter should not be overlooked. The fifth contract, mudarabin, profit sharing. Three main components should be observed. The capital, which should be known cash given to the worker. Mudarabu is not permissible with coins or goods as trade becomes restricted. Specifying a certain amount of cash is also not valid as the profit amount becomes uncertain. Limiting the worker's actions invalidates the contract as it restricts trade opportunities. The profit should be known as a percentage, like a third or half. Specifying a fixed profit amount is invalid as the profit might not exceed that amount. The worker's role, which should be unrestricted trade, not confined to specifics like buying only cattle for breeding or wheat for baking. Mudarabal is authorized only for buying and selling and their necessities, not for specific crafts like baking or livestock care. Restricting the worker's trade activities nullifies the contract. In Mudaraba, the worker acts as an agent and can make typical business decisions. The capital owner can dissolve the contract. If the capital is in cash at dissolution, division is straightforward. If it's in goods without profit, the worker returns them without converting them back to cash. The worker can sell them with the owner's consent. Profits are shared, but there's no obligation to sell excess over the capital. For annual profit assessment, the value of the capital must be known for zakat purposes. The worker's travel with Mudarabi capital requires the owner's permission. Otherwise, he bears full responsibility for all assets and prices. Travel expenses and safekeeping of the capital are borne by the Mudaraba funds. The sixth contract, partnership. There are four types of partnerships, three of which are invalid. General partnership, where partners agree to share all their assets and liabilities, is invalid. Partnership based solely on labor is invalid. Partnership based on influence and reputation, where one partner contributes influence and the other does the work, is also invalid. The only valid type is a mixed partnership, Mudaraba, where assets are merged indistinguishably and each partner authorizes the other to manage. 
Profits and losses are distributed according to the capital contribution. This cannot be altered by agreement. The partnership ends with division or dissolution. It's permissible to form a partnership with purchased goods, not just cash, unlike in Mudaraba. Every earner must learn this level of jurisprudence to avoid inadvertently engaging in the unlawful. Transactions with butchers, bakers, and grocers are essential for both earners and non-earners. Issues arise from neglecting sale conditions, salon conditions, or relying on barter, where practices involve daily transactions followed by periodic accounting and valuation based on mutual agreement. We permit these practices out of necessity, interpreting delivery as granting consumption rights while awaiting compensation. However, consuming such goods creates an obligation to pay their value at the time of consumption. Once an agreement on the total value is reached, a general release from the sellers is advisable to ensure no remaining obligations, especially if there's a valuation discrepancy. This approach is necessary because daily weighing and explicit agreement for each minor transaction are impractical. When transaction types are numerous, valuation becomes easier. God grants success. The third chapter, on establishing justice and avoiding injustice in transactions. Understand that a transaction may proceed in a manner deemed valid and binding by a jurist yet it might contain elements of injustice, incurring the wrath of God. Not every prohibition leads to the invalidity of a contract. This injustice refers to harm inflicted on others, and it is of two kinds, general harm and harm specific to the transaction. The first kind, general harm, this includes several types. Type 1. Hoarding hoarding is when a food seller stores food to wait for a price increase which is a general form of injustice and condemned in religious law. The Prophet Muhammad A. said, whoever hoards food for 40 days and then donates it, such charity does not absolve him from hoarding. Ibn Umar reported that the Prophet A. said, whoever hoards food for 40 days is free of God and God is free of him. It's as if he has killed everyone. Ali, may God be pleased with him, said, Whoever hoards food for forty days hardens his heart. He also burned the food of a hoarder. The Prophet A praised selling food at the day's price as akin to charity or freeing a slave. The verse, and whoever does injustice in it, the earth, we will make him taste a painful punishment. Quran 22:25 includes hoarding as an injustice. There's a story of a merchant who delayed selling grain in Basra, waiting for a price hike then donated the profits to charity as atonement for hoarding. The prohibition of hoarding applies universally, but considerations should be made based on the type of commodity and time. The prohibition is clear in the case of basic foods. However, items that are not staples but aid in sustenance, like meat and fruits, require further consideration. Some scholars extend the prohibition to items like oil and honey. The context of time is also critical. During scarcity, hoarding items that could alleviate hunger is more severely condemned. Hoarding always carries some degree of dislike, as it anticipates harm through price increases. Overall, trading in staples is generally discouraged as it seeks profit from essentials. A follower advised against involving one's child in two trades or crafts, food selling and coffin selling as they might wish for high prices or people's deaths, and butchering or goldsmithing, as they harden the heart or embellish worldly life. Type 2. Promoting counterfeit money promoting counterfeit dirhams within circulation is unjust, as it harms the unsuspecting recipient. If the recipient knows, he may circulate it further, thus perpetuating and expanding the harm. The person who initiates this practice bears the sin of all who follow it. The Prophet Muhammad A said, Whoever initiates a bad precedent, and others act upon it, bears its sin, and the sin of those who act upon it without diminishing their sins. 
Spending a counterfeit dirham is worse than stealing a hundred dirhams because theft is a single sin, but circulating counterfeit money is a continuing sin. There are five points to consider regarding counterfeit money. Disposing of counterfeit money. If someone receives counterfeit money, they should dispose of it in a way that prevents its use, like throwing it into a well. It should not be used in another transaction. Learning to recognize genuine money. Traders should learn how to identify genuine currency to avoid unintentionally giving counterfeit money to others. This knowledge is a duty when its application helps others. Receiving known counterfeit money. If someone knowingly accepts counterfeit money, they are still at fault as they likely plan to pass it on to others. Accepting counterfeit money with good intentions. If someone accepts counterfeit money with the intention of disposing of it properly, they may be included in the blessings of the prophet's a statement. May God have mercy on a person who is easy when he sells, easy when he buys, easy when he claims a debt, and lenient when he demands repayment. However, if their intention is to circulate it, they are misled by evil. Dealing with partially counterfeit money. There is a distinction between completely counterfeit money and partially counterfeit or debased coins. If the debased currency is the standard in a region, transactions with it might be permissible depending on the amount of genuine metal. If a coin's value is less than the standard, the seller should inform the buyer. The path of righteousness in trade, like refusing to circulate counterfeit money, is more commendable than engaging in supererogatory acts of worship. It's noted that a trader who is truthful is more beloved to God than a person who is merely devout. There's a story of a warrior who learned his horse was affected by his act of using counterfeit money showing the extended impact of one's actions. Second section, harm specific to the transaction partner. Every action that harms the transaction partner is unjust, for justice does not involve harming a fellow Muslim. The general principle here is not to wish for your brother what you would not wish for yourself. Anything that would be difficult or burdensome for you should not be imposed on others. Rather, one should consider their money as valuable as their own. It is said that selling something to a brother Muslim at a price at which one would not buy it for oneself is a betrayal of the mutual advice mandated in transactions and a failure to wish for others what one wishes for oneself. The details of this involve four aspects. Not praising the goods with qualities they do not possess. Not concealing any defects or hidden qualities of the goods. Not deceiving in their weight or quantity. Not hiding any aspect of their price that, if known, would deter the buyer. As for the first aspect, refraining from undue praise is important. Describing goods with non-existent qualities is lying. If the buyer accepts such descriptions, it is deceit and injustice along with lying. If the buyer does not accept, it is merely lying and a loss of integrity. Praising goods accurately but excessively is also unnecessary and holds one accountable for every word utter. God says, not a word does he, man, utter, but there is a watcher by him ready to record it. However, highlighting unknown qualities of the goods to the buyer is acceptable as long as it is done without exaggeration and with the intention of genuinely informing the buyer. The second aspect is the obligation to reveal all defects of the goods, whether hidden or apparent. Concealing defects is both dishonest and a violation of the duty to provide sincere advice in transactions, as mandated by Islamic teachings. The third aspect is ensuring honesty in the measurement and quantity of the goods, as deceit in these matters is prohibited. The fourth aspect involves being transparent about the price and not concealing any information that might influence the buyer's decision. In summary, Transactions should be conducted with honesty and a sincere intention to treat others as one would like to be treated. The goal is not just to gain profit, but to conduct business in a way that aligns with ethical and religious principles. 
This approach may be challenging, but is crucial for maintaining integrity and trust in business dealings. Second meaning. Essential belief for sincere advice in transactions. One must believe that the rewards and riches of the hereafter are superior to the gains of this world. The benefits of worldly wealth are fleeting, ending with life, but its injustices and burdens persist. How can a wise person prefer what is inferior, worldly gains, over what is better, spiritual gains? True good lies in preserving one's religion. The Prophet Muhammad A. said, the declaration of there is no God, but Allah continues to protect people from God's wrath as long as they do not prioritize worldly transactions over their hereafter. In another narration, as long as they do not care about what decreases from their world in exchange for the integrity of their religion. When they do that and say there is no God but Allah, God Almighty says, You have lied, you are not truthful. And in another hadith, Whoever says there is no God but Allah sincerely will enter paradise. Asked about its sincerity, he said, It is to guard it against what Allah has forbidden. Knowing these matters compromise one's faith, and faith is the capital for the hereafter. One should not waste this everlasting capital for momentary worldly gains. A follower once said that if asked who the best among people in a mosque is, he would point to the most sincere and the worst would be the most deceitful. Deceit is forbidden in all transactions and crafts. A craftsman should not be negligent in his work. He should perfect his craft and reveal any faults. For example, a cobbler was advised to make both shoes equally well and not to favor one over the other. One must be honest in quantity. Ensuring scales and measures are accurate, as warned in the Quran. Woe to those who give less than do, who, when they take a measure from people, take in full, but when they give by measure or by weight to them, give less than do. Honesty in transactions is vital, and avoiding deceit is key. Lastly, one must be truthful about the current market price and not hide anything that would influence the transaction. The Prophet A forbade intercepting traders to deceive them about market prices and bid rigging. These prohibitions indicate that hiding or deceiving about the current market price in transactions is dishonest and against the required sincerity in dealings. An example is given of a follower who, after profiting greatly from a price increase he hid from a seller, felt remorse and returned the profit to ensure honesty and adherence to ethical principles in commerce. These teachings highlight the importance of not taking advantage of others' ignorance or misfortune in trade. True justice and sincerity towards fellow Muslims are crucial in transactions, and one must always strive to be honest and fair, seeking the ultimate reward in the hereafter rather than temporary worldly gains. Chapter 4 On Benevolence in Dealings God the Almighty has commanded both justice and benevolence. Justice is the basis of salvation and operates in trade like the capital. Benevolence, on the other hand, is the means to success and achieving happiness. Functioning in trade like the prophet, a wise person is not content with just preserving their capital in worldly transactions. Similarly, in matters of the hereafter, a devout person should not just adhere to justice and avoid injustice, but should also embrace the doors of benevolence. God says, And do good as Allah has been good to you. He also says, Indeed, Allah commands justice and good conduct. And He says, Indeed, the mercy of Allah is near to the doers of good. Benevolence here means to do what benefits the other party in a transaction, which is not obligatory but a grace on his part. The obligatory falls under the category of justice and avoiding injustice, which we have already mentioned. One can achieve the rank of benevolence through one of six matters. First, in the matter of unfair gain, it is appropriate not to cheat one's partner beyond the usual. As for the origin of unfair gain, it is permitted, since trade is for profit, which is impossible without some degree of gain. 
However, one should consider moderation. If the buyer pays more than the usual profit out of keen interest or urgent need, it is benevolent to refuse such an offer. And if there's no deception, taking the extra is not injustice. Some scholars believe that cheating beyond a third gives the option of annulment, but we do not see it that way. However, it is benevolent to reduce such cheating. It's narrated that Eunice Ibn Abade had robes of varying prices. He set the value of each robe at 400, but sold each for 200. Once, when he went to pray, leaving his nephew in the shop, a Bedouin came and bought a robe for 400. Eunice, recognizing his robe, asked the Bedouin about the price. The Bedouin, satisfied with the purchase, refused to return it even though Eunice offered him a refund, insisting on his initial price. Eunice admonished his nephew for not fearing God and exploiting the Muslim buyers. True benevolence was exemplified by the story of Asari Asakati, who bought a kernel of nuts for 60 dinars and noted in his ledger a profit of 3 dinars, despite the market value being 90. When a broker came to buy, Asari refused to sell for more than 63 dinars, even though the broker insisted on paying 90. Aware of the market value, neither the broker bought nor Asari sold, exemplifying pure benevolence from both sides. Another instance of benevolence was shown by Muhammad ibn al munqadir who had apartments for five and ten dinars. In his absence, his slave mistakenly sold a five dinar apartment for ten. Upon learning this, Muhammad sought the buyer all day to rectify the mistake. He offered the buyer three options. Take a 10 dinar apartment for his money, get a refund of 5 dinars, or return the apartment and take back his 10 dinars. The buyer chose the refund of 5 dinars. This act of benevolence meant not profiting more than half or 1 dinar, as per the usual practice for such goods in that place. Those content with little profit will have frequent transactions and gain more profit, manifesting blessing. Ali. May God be pleased with him, used to roam the Kufa market, urging traders to take rightful earnings to be safe. He advised them not to refuse small profits, lest they lose out on larger ones. It was said to Abdur Rahman ibn Auf, May God be pleased with him, what is the reason for your prosperity? He replied, Three things. I never turned away a profit, never delayed a sale when an animal was requested from me and never sold on credit. It is said that he once sold a thousand camels and made a profit only equivalent to their bridles. He sold each bridle for a dirham, thus making a thousand dirhams profit, in addition to the daily upkeep of the camels. Secondly, in tolerating unfair gain, if a buyer purchases food from someone weak or something from a poor person, it's fine to tolerate some loss and be lenient, thus being benevolent. This is in line with the saying of the Prophet Muhammad, Peace be upon him. May Allah have mercy on a person who is easy in his buying and selling. However, if buying from a wealthy trader who seeks profit beyond his needs, tolerating unfair gain is not praiseworthy. It's wasting money without reward or praise. A hadith from the family of the Prophet states, The one who suffers loss in buying is neither praiseworthy nor rewarded. Iyaz ibn Muawiyah, a wise judge from Basra, said, I am not deceitful, and the deceitful cannot cheat me, nor can they cheat Ibn Siren, but they can cheat al Hazan and my father Muawiyah. The ideal is not to cheat nor be cheated, as described by some about Yuman. May God be pleased with him. He was too noble to deceive and too wise to be deceived. al Hazan, al Hussein and others from the righteous predecessors would scrutinize their purchases and then generously give more than the value. When asked why they would negotiate for a small amount and then give generously without care, one of them replied, The giver gives from his surplus, but the one who is cheated loses his sense. Thirdly, in collecting the price and other debts, benevolence is shown through forgiveness and reduction. Delay and leniency in demanding the quality of payment. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, 
May Allah have mercy on a man who is easy in his buying, selling, and in demanding his rights. He also said, Be lenient, and you will be treated leniently. And whoever gives time to a debtor or forgives the debt, Allah will make his reckoning easy. In another narration, Allah will shade him under his throne on the day there is no shade but his. The Prophet mentioned a man who was extravagant, who had no good deeds upon reckoning. He recalled only that he used to give time to the wealthy and forgive the debts of the poor. The Prophet said, We are more deserving of doing that than he is, and God forgave them. He also said, Whoever lends a dinar until its repayment will have a charity for each day until it's due. And if he gives more time after it's due, he will have the equivalent charity of that debt for each day. Some predecessors preferred not to have their debts repaid quickly because of this saying, as it was like giving charity every day. The prophet said, I saw on the gate of paradise. Charity is rewarded tenfold, and alone eighteenfold. This is because charity can go to the needy and non-needy, but only the needy bear the humiliation of borrowing. The prophet saw a man persisting in collecting a debt and gestured to the creditor to reduce it by half, which he did. He then told the debtor to pay up. Anyone who sells something and leaves the price for the time being without insisting on its immediate collection is like a lender. It is narrated that al Hayes and al-Basri sold a garment for 400 dirhams. When the buyer was to pay, he asked for leniency. al Hazen reduced the 100 dirhams. The buyer then asked for more kindness. So al Hazen gave another 100 dirhams as a gift, receiving only 200 dirhams. It was said to al Hazen, this is half the price, to which he replied, that is how benevolence should be, otherwise it is not. Another saying goes, take your right fully and modestly, whether the debtor is able to pay or not, and Allah will make your reckoning easy. Fourthly, in debt repayment, benevolence in this regard is good repayment, which involves going to the creditor without making them come to collect the debt. The Prophet said, whoever borrows intending to repay, Allah appoints angels to protect him and pray for him until he repays. Some predecessors borrowed without needing to, just for this reward. If the creditor speaks harshly, the debtor should bear it and respond kindly, following the prophet's example. When a creditor spoke harshly to him, his companions wanted to intervene, but he said, let him speak, for the creditor has a right to speak. In disputes between borrowers and lenders, it is better to lean towards the indebted as the lender lends from abundance and the borrower borrows out of need. The same goes for aiding the buyer more than the seller, as the seller wants to promote his goods while the buyer needs them. This holds unless the debtor exceeds limits. Then, it is just to prevent his excess and assist his creditor. The prophet said, Help your brother, whether he is an oppressor or oppressed. When asked how to help the oppressor, he replied, Preventing him from oppressing is helping him. Fifthly, to cancel a deal when asked, as one only asks for cancellation out of regret or distress from the sale. It's not right to be a cause of distress for a brother. The Prophet said, Whoever cancels a regretted deal, Allah will cancel his missteps on the day of judgment. Sixthly, to deal with a group of poor people on credit intending not to dim in payment if they can afford it later. Some righteous predecessors had two account books, one for unknown names of the weak and poor, allowing them to take what they needed on credit without intending to collect it, not even recording it as debt, but as a gift, to be repaid if possible, and forgiven if not. These are the ways of the trading of the predecessors, now rare. Anyone practicing them revives this tradition. In summary, trade is a test of a man's religion and piety. As it is said, do not be deceived by a man's past shirt, or a garment lifted above the ankle, or a forehead showing signs of prostration. Look at his behavior with money to see his piety or corruption. Also, it is said, if a man is praised by his neighbors in town, his companions on a journey, and his business associates in the market, do not doubt his righteousness. A witness appeared before Umar, 
May God be pleased with them, who asked for someone who knew him. A man praised the witness, but Umar asked if he was his closest neighbor, his travel companion, or had dealt with him in money matters, to which the man replied no. Umar said, I suppose you saw him standing in the mosque, reciting the Quran, sometimes lowering and raising his head, and dismissed the witness, asking the man to bring someone who truly knew him. Chapter 5 on the merchant's concern for his religion and his business and its impact on his hereafter. It is not appropriate for a merchant to let his livelihood distract him from his ultimate return to God, becoming one who trades the life of this world for the hereafter. Instead, a wise person should be concerned for himself. This concern includes preserving his capital, where his capital is his religion and his trade within it. Some of the predecessors said, The most deserving thing for a wise person is what he needs most urgently. And what he needs most urgently is that which will have the best outcome in the hereafter. Muad bin Jabal, may God be pleased with him, in his advice said, You must have your share in this world, but you are more in need of your share in the hereafter. So start with your share of the hereafter. Take it and you will pass by your share in this world and acquire it. God the Almighty says, and do not forget your portion of the world, meaning do not forget your share in it for the hereafter. As this world is the field for the hereafter, where good deeds are acquired, the merchant's concern for his religion is realized by considering seven matters. First, good intention and belief at the beginning of trade. He should intend to become self-sufficient not dependent on others, and seek lawful earnings. He should use his earnings to support his religion and provide for his family, making him among those who strive with their wealth. He should intend to advise Muslims, wish for others what he wishes for himself, follow the path of justice and benevolence in his transactions as mentioned earlier, and enjoin good and forbid evil in the market. If he harbors these beliefs and intentions, he works towards the hereafter. If he gains wealth, it's an addition. If he loses in this world, he gains in the hereafter. Second, he should view his craft or trade as fulfilling one of the communal obligations. Trades and crafts are essential. If neglected, livelihoods would cease and most people would perish. The well-being of all depends on everyone's cooperation and each group taking responsibility for a task. If everyone focused on one craft, others would be neglected, leading to ruin. This is why some interpret the Prophet Muhammad saying, the disagreement of my community is a mercy, as referring to their differing focuses in crafts and trades. Some crafts are vital, while others aimed at luxury and adornment in this world can be done without. He should engage in essential crafts, fulfilling a communal duty in religion, and avoid crafts like engraving, goldsmithing, and extravagant construction, as such are disdained by the religious. Avoiding trades like entertainment and instruments forbidden for use falls under avoiding injustice. This includes tailoring silk garments for men and making gold vessels or rings for men as these are sinful acts. Third, he should strive in his craft or trade as part of the communal obligations. If such trades and crafts were abandoned, livelihoods would cease, and most of the population would perish. The system works through everyone's cooperation, with each group taking on a specific role. If everyone focused on a single craft, the rest would be neglected, leading to ruin. This idea is sometimes related to the Prophet's statement. The disagreement of Myama is a mercy, understood here as their diverse interests in crafts and trades. While some trades are essential, others, geared more towards luxury and decoration, can be less necessary. The merchant should engage in significant crafts to fulfill his communal religious duties and avoid less essential ones like engraving, jewelry making and extravagant construction disliked by religious figures. 
Activities like making entertainment tools or items prohibited for use should be avoided as they fall under the category of injustice. This includes tailoring silk garments for men and making gold accessories for them, as these are considered sinful activities. Fourth, avoiding trades that exploit others' misfortunes or necessities, such as food trading and coffin selling is disliked as it involves profiting from people's deaths or needs. Butchery is discouraged due to its potential to harden the heart, and trades like cupping or cleaning, involving filth, are also frowned upon, similar to tanning and related crafts. Ibn Sirin disliked acting as a broker, and Katata disapproved of broker fees, possibly due to the inherent need for exaggeration and deceit in such roles. Fifth. Engaging in trades that are inherently beneficial and ethical, such as cloth trading, is recommended. Said ibn Nusayyib expressed a preference for cloth trading as long as it involved no falsehoods. It's narrated, The best of your trades is cloth, and the best of your crafts is silk weaving. Another hadith states, If the people of Medina were to trade, they would trade in cloth. And if the people of Hellfire were to trade, they would trade in currency exchange. 6. Currency exchange is discouraged due to the challenges in avoiding the subtleties of usury and because it focuses on minute qualities in items whose essence isn't the main goal but rather their circulation. A money changer rarely profits without exploiting others' ignorance about currency details, making it difficult for them to remain in free even with caution. 7. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and his companions discourage trades focused on excessive breaking down and remelting of gold and silver. Ahmad ibn Hanbal expressed his dislike for breaking down gold and silver, preferring trades that involve buying dinars with durhams, then buying gold with durhams and shaping it. Trading in cloth is preferred, as it is seen as a wholesome business, avoiding unnecessary oaths and deceit. In summary, the merchant must carefully balance his worldly pursuits with his religious duties, ensuring his trade practices align with ethical and religious principles. This balance ensures his success in both this world and the hereafter. Third, the markets of this world should not prevent one from attending to the markets of the hereafter, which are the mosques. God the Almighty says, Men who neither trade nor sale diverts from the remembrance of Allah nor from performing the prayer, nor from giving the zakat. And Allah says, in houses, Allah has permitted to be raised and that his name be mentioned therein. Therefore, it is important to dedicate the early part of the day, until entering the marketplace, to matters of the hereafter by staying in the mosque and persisting in devotional practices. You ma, may God be pleased with him, advise traders. Make the beginning of your day for your hereafter, and what follows for your worldly life. The righteous predecessors used to devote the beginning and end of their day to the hereafter and the middle part of the day to their trade. They would not sell porridge and heads early in the morning except to children in the dimmest, non-Muslim citizens of the Islamic State, because they would be in the mosques afterwards. It is narrated that when the angels ascend with a servant's record, and it contains remembrance of Allah and good deeds at the beginning and end of the day. Allah forgives the sins committed in between. Another narration says, The angels of night and day meet at dawn and at the afternoon prayer, and Allah, while being more knowledgeable about them, asks, How did you leave my servants? They respond, We left them while they were praying, and we approached them while they were praying. God then says, I bear witness that I have forgiven them. When one hears the call to prayer for Dar and Asar, it is important not to be diverted by work, but to leave immediately and abandon all activities, as the virtue of performing the first takbir with the Imam at the beginning of the prayer time is incomparable to anything of this world. Some scholars consider neglecting the congregation as disobedience. The predecessors would hasten to the mosque at the call to prayer leaving the markets to children and the dimmest. They used to hire people with small coins to guard their shops during the prayer times, and this was a source of livelihood for them. 
In the explanation of the verse, neither trade nor sale diverts them from the remembrance of Allah. It is mentioned that they were blacksmiths and leather workers. When one of them would lift the hammer or insert the awl and heard the call to prayer, he would not pull out the awl or drop the hammer, but would leave it and go to pray. Fourth, one should not limit themselves to this, but should also engage in the remembrance of God in the market, involving themselves in glorifying and praising Him. Remembering God in the market among the heedless is superior. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the one who remembers God among those who forget is like a warrior behind fleeing soldiers, and like the living among the dead. In another narration, like a green tree among dry ones, he also said, Whoever enters the market and says, There is no God but Allah, he is alone without a partner. To him belongs the dominion, to him belongs all praise, he gives life and death, and he is ever living and does not die. In his hand is all good and he is capable of all things. Allah will write for him a million good deeds. Ibn Umar, Salim ibn Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Wasi, and others would enter the market intending to earn the virtue of this remembrance. Al-Hazan said, The one who remembers Allah in the market will come on the day of resurrection with light like the moons and proof like the sense. Whoever seeks forgiveness in the market, Allah will forgive him as many times as the number of its inhabitants. Umar, may God be pleased with him, upon entering the market, would say, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disbelief and transgression, and from the evil encompassed by the market. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from a false oath and a losing transaction. Abu Jafar al-Fargani recounted, We were with Junaid one day. And some people who sat in mosques imitating the Sufis criticized those who entered the market, claiming they fell short in fulfilling the rights of sitting there. Junaid then said, How many in the market deserve to enter the mosque? And some of those in the mosque should be taken out and replaced by them. I know a man who enters the market and performs 300 rakahs and 30,000 praises every day. I thought he was referring to himself. Thus, this was the practice of those who traded to meet their necessities, not for worldly indulgence, for those who seek the world to assist with the hereafter. How can they abandon the profit of the hereafter? The market, mosque, and home have the same ruling, and salvation lies in piety. The prophet said, Fear Allah wherever you are. The duty of piety does not cease regardless of one's circumstances and in it lies their life and sustenance. As therein they see their trade and profit, it is said, Whoever loves the hereafter lives, and whoever loves the world strays. The fool wanders aimlessly, and the wise scrutinize their own faults. Fifth, though one should not be overly eager about the market and trade, which is indicated by being the first to enter and the last to leave, and engaging in sea trade, as both are disliked. It is said that those who venture into the sea have gone to extremes in seeking provision. A narration states, One should not sail the sea except for Hajj, Umrah, or Jihad. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Az, May God be pleased with them, used to say, Do not be the first to enter the market, nor the last to leave. For therein the devil lays its segs and hatches them. It is narrated from Muadab and Jabal and Abdullah ibn Umar that Iblis instructs his son Zalmbur, Go with your troops to the people of the market, beautify for them lying, swearing, deception, trickery, and betrayal, and be with the first entrant and the last to leave. Another narration states, The worst places are the markets, and the worst of its people are the first to enter and the last to leave. The complete caution involves monitoring one's sufficient needs. Once they are met, one should leave and engage in the trade of the hereafter. The righteous predecessors would leave the market satisfied with a small profit. Hamad ibn Salama used to sell silk and would leave once he earned a small profit. Ibrahim ibn Bashar said to Ibrahim ibn Adhan, I plan to work in clay today. He replied, O son of Bashar, you are sought by him who you cannot escape, and you seek what has been provided for you. Haven't you seen the greedy deprived and the weak provided for? 
I said, I have a small amount with the grocer, to which he replied, you own that much and still seek work. Some of them would leave the market after dark, others after ASR, and some work only a day or two a week, content with that. 6. One should not merely avoid the forbidden, but also avoid doubtful matters and suspicions. Not relying solely on that was, but consulting one's heart. If one feels an ease, they should avoid it. If a product is brought with doubtful aspects, one should inquire until clarity is gained, lest they fall into doubt. Milk was brought to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he asked, Where did you get this? When told it was from a sheep, he asked, And where did this sheep come from? And was informed of its place. He then drank it and said, We, the community of prophets, are commanded to eat only what is pure and to do only what is righteous. He also said, Allah has commanded the believers with what he commanded the messengers. And O you who have believed, eat from the good things which we have provided for you. The Prophet inquired about the origin of the item and its source, but no further, as beyond that is impractical. We will explain in the book of Halal and Haram the necessity of this questioning. For the Prophet did not inquire about everything brought to him. A trader should consider whom they deal with, avoiding those associated with injustice, betrayal, theft, or usury, as well as soldiers and oppressors, their supporters and helpers, as this aids in oppression. A man was involved in building a fortress at a border. And although the work was good and part of Islamic duties, he felt uneasy because the ruler overseeing it was oppressive. He asked Sufayan, who advised not to help them in any way. The least implication would be preferring their continuity to receive one's dues, thus desiring the persistence of those disobeying God. Another narration says, Whoever prays for the oppressor's longevity loves disobedience to Allah on his earth and all eyes angry when the wicked are praised. In another hadith, whoever honors a wicked person helps in demolishing Islam. Sufayan entered Al-Mahdi's presence with a whiting pot. Al-Mahdi asked for ink to write, but Sufayan insisted on knowing what he would write first, offering it only if it was just. A scholar detained by a ruler was asked to hand him clay to seal a letter, but he demanded to see the letter first. Thus. They were cautious in aiding oppressors, and religious people should avoid dealing with them whenever possible. In general, one should distinguish between whom to deal with and whom not to, dealing with fewer people in these times. It was said, there was a time when one could deal with anyone in the market. Then it became deal with anyone except so and so. Then it became deal only with so and so. I fear a time will come when even this will not be possible. It seems that time has already arrived, as war. To God we belong, and to Him we return. 7. One should carefully monitor all aspects of their transactions with each customer, as they are being watched and will be held accountable. Prepare answers for the day of reckoning for every action and statement. Why did you do it? For what reason? On the day of judgment, a trader will stand for each person they sold something to, accountable for each one. They will be judged for every person they dealt with. One of them said, I saw a trader in a dream, and I asked, What did Allah do with you? He replied, Fifty thousand records were spread before me. I said, Are these all sins? He replied, These are transactions with people. Each person I dealt with in the world has an individual record from the first to the last of our dealings. This is the responsibility of a merchant in their work, to be just, benevolent, and concerned for their religion. If they limit themselves to justice, they are among the righteous. If they add benevolence, they are among the close ones to God. And if they observe the religious duties as mentioned in the fifth chapter, they are among the truthful, and God knows best what is correct. 